I think what we're gonna do today is we've got the video running and we're just gonna go through um, a couple random dApps and look at the contract approval process from start to finish and show what users uh, can and should be doing to make sure that they're not uh, approving malicious contracts or how, how they can verify that they're in the right place and they're, they're, this kind of attack uh, could hopefully be, be prevented in the future. So um, I don't know, what, let's get started. I, I, we just uh, kind of did this on the, on the spur of the moment, so I don't have a, a plan. What do you think, uh, Sushi Swap or what's yeah, kind of like a sounds, good starting um, place for- uh, Sounds good uh, to go with Sushi. I think starting with a blue chip is a great idea. That way we can show what a, a reputable project uh, uh, will do and how they're gonna present themselves. Uh, also, Sushi's contracts are immutable, which means that they, they're not upgradable. They will not change over time. Whatever address you see is exactly the address that you're always supposed to see. And the source code is also supposed to never change. Again, the keyword being immutable. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, check uh, the Sushi uh, contracts. So uh, there's always two ways in which you can approach this idea. Uh, there's the more nerdy way, and then there's the more, let's say, due diligence way. Uh, the due diligence way will be to check on the docs. That's the first thing you will do. You, will, you wouldn't interact with the DAP at all, you will just check for the docs. In the case for Sushi, there's probably gonna be the free dots, so you can go in the app or you can learn more, but there should be like free dots in the app and the DAP will, will give you the option to see the docs on the right side. You'll typically find the docs either in the footer at the bottom of the website or typically in a menu, that's the case. And then what you will wanna uh, do if you're not familiar with coding at all, is you probably wanna read a little bit about the project. In the case of Sushi, Sushi is a Uniswap v2 fork. And so uh, you would literally expect that the code that Sushi has is the same as the code from Uniswap v2. And so if you, uh, in a way, as a non-technical uh, user, you would um, trust the security of Uniswap because it's, it wasn't never hacked. And by transitive property, you're like, if the code is exactly the same as the one from Uniswap and there is literally zero changes because it's literally a copy paste, a fork, then perhaps Sushi is safe because Uniswap is safe. Uh, does that make sense as a uh, general idea? It does, yeah. I mean, I think most users are not gonna know Maybe they would know that it's a fork of Uniswap, but I don't know if they would make that connection that they can like go back and check the code is exactly the same. Like that's not something that I would really think about. But um, yeah, if that's if that or like if I'm on a new app, then um, then I I wouldn't necessarily know like where it came from. But that's, that's yeah, fair. absolutely. I'll, I think I'm that gonna, logic makes uh, sense. Definitely try to make it as simple as as I, as I can, and I think it's a good point. Uh, this point, though, is really important when you go on uh, new frontiers. Let's say there's a new chain or a bunch of new liquidity mining programs. Most new dApps will just be forks. So the ability of checking what are called diffs or differences uh, is actually extremely important when you want to be super early. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that you can, there's a website called rugdoc.io. Um, it used to be uh, small. Now it's actually a very popular website. And what they do is they basically just uh, compare Sushi, um, uh, what are they called? Sushi MasterChef's contracts uh, for liquidity mining rewards. And because that way you can see whether they are, uh, these contracts are safe or not, because most contracts are always forks of each other. And so um, it, it literally takes one line to steal your funds and uh, having somebody that actually checks for that uh, can be really helpful. Uh, I don't think they cover uh, blue chips, so I don't think you'll find Sushi, I don't think you'll find Badger, I don't think you'll find Yearn, I don't think you'll find any of those. However, having a resource such as that, uh, which basically means that you have developers that are actually checking the code for you, uh, can be an extremely useful resource when it comes to uh, checking the code uh, when you have no technical knowledge. Cool, so make sure to check something like this for new chains, yield farming, new new things that are launching. Yeah, so basically we are, uh, uh, in a way we're crowdsourcing security. That's also something to keep in mind is that you're, you, like you're alone in your decision to sign the transaction. Nobody else can do it for you unless they are physically, you know, pressing the button for you. Uh, but you, you're not alone in figuring out if the contracts are safe or not. So typically most projects will have a Discord, a Telegram. There's a bunch of Telegrams that are public related to DeFi in general 
where you can probably ask for uh, for help uh, as well. That said, we can go back to the uh, contracts, I guess, the sushi contracts. And most projects will have a um, the keyword is going to be either contracts or addresses or deployment. So I think if we scroll down a little bit, we should find it. Uh, I think these are actually not the developer docs. So there's dev docs. So some projects will even abstract that away. And then you'll just find contracts, literally sushi swap contracts. That's uh, going to be just a dump of contracts, right? So now we have a list of these contracts. Uh, to us, it's just a bunch of strings. They're just uh, numbers and letters. Um, but now we know that these are the, the numbers and letters, the contracts that we're supposed to see when we're using the DAP. So now we have a, a proof, a tangible proof of what we're, what we're expecting to find. Um, assuming a zero technical background, you don't need to do anything at this point. You just need to have this list so that when you start interacting with the DAP, you can compare the addresses that you're given inside of the DAP on MetaMask against the addresses that you're given in the docs. All right, so let's say I'm going, um, I'm in the Sushi app and I just wanna basically make a swap, right? So I, I think I'm on this address. I have a little bit of ETH. Yeah, so because we're using Sushi, I will actually start by just using any token so that we can see the approval uh, transaction first. And that's a typical operation you'll have. Anytime you use a token, which hopefully you, you have, yeah, you, I see that you have something. So whatever token you have, you will probably, um, no, we need to do the, the opposite swap. So it will be from dollars to ETH, because uh, that way we're pulling the dollars, sending them to Sushi and getting back the other token. In this case, okay. you do not have a balance. So let's pick a token that you do have. I think you had like Doge or something. Shiba. No, I have some ENS. Got the ENS airdrop. All right, let's do, uh, uh, you know, let's paper and some ENS. All right. All right, so it's not coming. Oh, here we go. It's coming up. There you go. So now we have selected the token. And the first step that you see in most apps will just be to approve. Um, let's uh, put one on the tokens because you let's say you don't want to sell all of them this is already there's going to be some nuance here so we may want to do the approval twice just to make sure what's going on because you really want to understand what we're about to do so the first thing what's happening right now is that this javascript program that you're seeing the website is checking if you have approved dns against a contract which is called a router, but basically against a contract that we still don't know what it is because we haven't verified that. But the, the, the application is establishing that you did not give approval to that contract and as such is asking you to approve your tokens for that contract. The reason why is because in order for any application to be able to take your funds and take your funds can be a dangerous thing or a normal operation, that's we're going to have to establish that later. But in order for anybody else, contract or person, to be able to take your funds, you have to give them the approval. So in a, in a vacuum, in the, without any knowledge, if you want to be safe, as long as you never give approval to anything, nobody can ever take your coins. Because the approval is the act of allowing something else, which could be a good contract that you want to use, or a bad actor that you want to avoid, um, but the approval will actually give them the power to move the funds. Without this approve, you can't move funds. The only person that can move them is yourself because you own those funds. Do you think uh, we made that clear, uh, Wasabi? Yeah, I mean, in, in Ethereum and EVM chains, in order to do anything with a token in your wallet, it needs to get the approval first and you need to make sure that it's the right contract that you're giving this approval to, basically. Exactly. You basically will not be able to use most of Ethereum unless you get used to this dynamic of giving out the approval. However, as a security consideration, your coins are not a risk. Uh, there may be some exceptions where the coins can still be rugged because the, 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 the token contract is malicious. But considering a safe token, let's say ENS, uh, which literally can't do much as a token, uh, it's just a ERC-20, a standard token, if you don't give the approval for ENS to anybody else, then nobody can take your tokens for any reason. At this point, we could press the approve 
And anytime you approve a token, MetaMask will show you a special interface. This is not the normal MetaMask interface. This is the approval interface that MetaMask will show you. And uh, there are some dark patterns here. Dark patterns it refers to idea, the idea that I'm kind of lying to you in terms of uh, uh, development uh, experience, in, in terms of how the graphic looks. Because what it's telling you is it's telling you that you're giving your permission to access the NS to app.sushi.com, which is a website. But the reality is that you can't give approval to a website because a website doesn't live on Ethereum. You're giving out approval to a smart contract. And so you want to you wanna really read this through because it actually is a little dense and, uh, and it's going to tell you a bunch of stuff. The first thing you're going to see, it should be your address in the top left, which you, sh you should be able to recognize, the, the one with the yellow icon on the left. Mm -hmm. So that's you. you. That's who you're acting on behalf of. You want to make sure that that's the address you want to actually use. Some people may have um, a hot wallet, a hotter wallet, a burner wallet, and then perhaps a cold wallet, which uh, um, they may be using MetaMask to use. So you want to make sure that you're interacting with the right address there. And then the second step is to figure out exactly what you're doing to exactly which contract. And so if we read the text, it's telling you by granting permission, you're allowing the following contract to access your funds. And then you see an address. That's the address that you're giving your funds uh, access to. So let's check that out on Etherscan. And we want to verify that this is a uh, legit address. So this actually looks like a pretty scammy thing, right? What is this? Let's check the contract. Zero transactions found. That's not a good sign. Let's see the contract. Just this, this uh, address yeah. here. So if you go on Etherscan and you check um, uh, the, the UI, oh, you see the that there's an here. advertisement and below the advertisement, there's a button. The current selected button is transfers. And then there's contract uh, in the middle. Yeah. In this case, we're not seeing the source for it. Perhaps we're seeing the, uh, for some reason, we're seeing the token uh, UI of Etherscan. This is also pretty weird. So if I was given this, this information right here, I wouldn't approve this transaction because there is something sketchy. Okay. And the, mm -hmm. there's, there's something sketchy is that it's showing you a token that has no holders, no transfers, and the contract is not verified. So this is a really sketchy situation. This is where it gets nuanced. In this case, it's the MetaMask UI that sent you to a link to inspect a token instead of inspecting a contract. So if you go on the right side and you check profile summary in Etherscan, and then you check contract and you click the blue link on the right side, profile summary, contract, and then you click the link, it should actually send you to the contract page. And now you'll see something that is a little more assuring. You'll see SushiSwap, router, an important keyword that you want to get familiar with. And then you see yep. that the contract is verified and you can see that because you'll see a green check on the contract word. Notice that a contract being verified doesn't mean that the contract is safe. It just means that you can see what the code looks like. Okay. So mm -hmm. perhaps so it's let's, not uh, saying that yep. it's not saying that Etherscan has verified that this is the correct sushi swap contract. Exactly. This green check mark only means that you can read the code. It doesn't mean that it's safe. It doesn't mean that anybody verified that it's useful. It doesn't mean that anybody likes it. It's not a, a sign of approval. It's literally the fact that if you go here, you have a third option called code, which you see it's currently selected and you can actually read the code. I don't expect you to read the code, but you definitely want to be in touch with somebody that can and somebody that can vouch as to why this is safe or why it is not. Um, if you want to uh, take your security extremely seriously, you should be reading the code and you should have a vague idea of what the code does, especially for the few functions that you're going to be calling. We're going to get that uh, later to when you actually do the swap, but you definitely want to at least 
check the name of the function that you're calling, see if there's something really sketchy about it. Uh, because uh, ultimately, these are really risky operations. Like you are basically trusting Etherscan to have verified the proper code. You're trusting the developer to not be uh, malicious and uh, you're giving them a lot of power uh, when you sign the approval transaction, right? Got it. So I think it may be easiest to do it again, just to make sure that, that we really got this down. Uh, we could go back to Sushi. Yep. And, uh, so I'll reject this one. Yeah, anytime you don't know what's going on, you're always gonna reject by default. The default is not to confirm, the default is to reject. Because if you confirm something you don't understand, it's gonna be you're gonna have a bad time. Go ahead and reject it. Let's see what happens. Let's see if we. Well, I I, I don't understand when we first clicked on this. Yeah, it and it got to, to the zero address. transaction. So if this is the ENS token address or what token address is this? This is not the ENS token address. This is the address that you're giving approval to uh, when you're trying to use Sushi. So. We, we can get into the, the specific detail of how an approval works. I think it would be a good idea, but this is the nerd warning because we're going to get a little more technical. But what, what you just did, the link you just clicked is not the token that you're trying to send. This is the address that is going to be able to move your coins. So this, so this is kind of like a sub address in Sushi that the exactly. main contract is working through this address. Exactly. For some reason, for for a very like we should send a tweet to MetaMask, but for some reason, we're we're being presented with the token interface on Etherscan. So we can ignore MetaMask for a second and just go in the Etherscan side. If you look at the mm -hmm. URL, you're on Etherscan token and then an address, and because you are in that page, you're being presented a visualization of this address as if it was a token. But if you click on the contract address, the 0xd9 uh, on the right, you'll actually see, and if you look at the URL, the URL has changed from token to address and then the same address. And now this visualization is showing you information about what resides at that address. The first question so you want to ask the yourself. Same, yep. This is the contract address, but it's, if you put token here, it thinks it's a token, and then it's just going to give you this it's a really zero weird page. Dumb uh, property of the application of Etherscan. Got it. Okay. So, uh, so we'll go back. We're rejecting the, this. Yep, yeah, we're rejecting that. And uh, once we, um, and I guess we we can go back to uh, you know getting the approval first. So again, you're going to get the approval every time you need to do a swap, and you didn't give approval before. And again, you're giving approval to a specific contract. The contract is um, in the, the gray area. So the way I will do it is I wouldn't use the arrow from Etherscan, but I will use the other option, which is the copy option, the one on the left. Uh, there's two, if you see, there's two boxes. The box on the left just copies the address. And then you just go on Etherscan, you type uh, uh, Etherscan on your browser, and then you paste the address. Yep. And then you put it in the box and enter. And now you'll be presented with the address, the name of the address, which could be fake. Sushi Swap Router could actually be fake, although it tends to be set up by the Etherscan team as a way to avoid uh, phishing. So it tends to be manually edited, but again, it doesn't, it's not a guarantee of security. And then you'll Wait, see where does it say a bunch Sushi of Swap Router. Oh, here it is. So Sushi I'm looking Swap. at the this big the uh, okay. white area right there. Yeah. And then um, you see some uh, token value, maybe it holds some funds, some contracts do, some contracts don't. And then you see a bunch of transactions. And uh, lastly, the green check mark on the contract tab. Mm -hmm. So again, the green check mark is not a security guarantee, but the fact that there's a lot of transactions and the fact that this verified, it definitely gives you a little bit more confidence than a sketchy contract with zero account, uh, a sketchy contract that is not a contract, for example, let's say it was a random address. So to show what a, uh, the difference between a contract and an address, the easiest thing we could do would be to click on contract creator. You see on the right side, there's a contract creator and there's a blue link. Yep, 
you see the second white box on the right side, more info. Oh, here, okay. And then there's contact yep. creator and you'll see like a 0xf94 address. This is the account that created this contract. So let's go and check it out. Let's just click. This is a um, EOA. This is a MetaMask account or a Trezor account or whatever. It's not a contract because there's no contract tab. There's no deployment on the right. And uh, it also is marked as SushiSwap Deployer, which typically for big projects is the marking that Etherscan will give you for a uh, deployer account, basically an official team member account. SushiSwap Contract Deployer here. Yeah. And then SushiSwap Deployer, the little tag on the uh, mm, white area, yeah, that yeah, one, yeah. that's the one uh, uh, most prominent. And so if you compare the two, you'll see that this is a MetaMask account. There's no uh, deployment because there's no deployment information on the right. There's no deployed by XYZ at transaction uh, one, two, three. And there is no contract tab. So this is a EOA, we call it externally owned account because it's not a smart contract. To, to make a long so story short. This, this could not even be a multi-sig, right? This me, if it this was a multi-sig, it would be a, a smart multi contract. A multi-sig okay. would be a smart contract. We can go uh, and I can show you how you will recognize a multi-sig and the different types. I'm happy to do that. The big thing, the last big takeaway from seeing this is that if you end up being requested to give approval and uh, you don't see the contract deployment, you're giving approval to a person, not a smart contract. And that's the biggest sign of phishing there is or a biggest sign of approval farming there is. And so uh, if you don't check who you're approving, um, unfortunately you could end up approving a MetaMask account and then the person that owns that MetaMask can just move their funds without your permission. Or rather you already gave them the permission to move your funds. It's that you may not realize that. And that's why approve is a very delicate operation. So just if you wanna open the previous tab, the one of the other, uh, the contract we were inspecting, you immediately wanna see that shape that on the right side, there is the contract creator. Let's go back to the other one. You'll see that that shape is not there. The page looks different. Immediately address on the top left instead of contract. And on the right side, there is a deployment transaction while there is no deployment here. And technically there's also the verification check mark for contract as well. So you immediately want to recognize uh, those, those shapes. You don't even need to know the details of it, but if you don't see the, the, the eaters come page looking like that with that uh, shape and that structure, immediately something is fishy there. Immediately something is off. But in this case, the sushi swap deployer, it's not sketchy because it would be natural that an EOA is actually in this case, um, in this case, the SushiSwap deployer simply deployed the contract. If we go back to MetaMask, MetaMask is asking us to approve a smart contract, right? It's asking Not us address, to approve yeah. the contract. And so at this time, we have no reason to be particularly suspicious. We're approving a contract. Uh, we want to do a swap. We're, we know that a swap has to be executed by a contract because they're called uh, uh, decentralized exchanges. So you would assume that the smart contract does the routing, right? It's not going to be a person doing the swap for you. It's going to be a contract. So there's nothing suspicious about um, us being asked to approve a contract at this time. Does that make sense? Got it. So let's. So going back, we're on Sushi. We need to approve it for the first time since we haven't before. The MetaMask approval comes up. We find this address, which is the contract that we're giving authorization to, and either view on Etherscan or for another level of security, copy, and then go directly to Etherscan and, and search for it. Yes. So then we're looking here. Okay, we see that this has been labeled by Etherscan as a SushiSwap router. So that looks good, right? Yep. And then we're seeing that this is not an EOA because we're seeing that a different address 
deployed this contract, right? Yes. We have proof that and it's a And then we can contract. generally see, and we okay, there are 3 million transactions. Yes. So there yeah. is activity there as well. So we have and some signs yeah. of uh, trustworthiness. The next sign will be to check that the address is present in the documentation, right? We this add one, this the contract. documentation already opened. So what you can do is literally, uh, it's the developer docs, that one. And then yep. you just command F. Uh, command F uh, will be a browser option. If you don't have it, you can just go in the settings and then uh, click on search. But most people know command F. And so you just uh, paste it and you find it. And you get Sushi V2 Router 02, which is a pretty scary name. But you did find that address in the documentation. So it is there, right? Got it. So this is Sushi telling us, here's our list of our approved contracts that we're publishing. And then we've gone through the interface, through MetaMask, and traced it back to the Sushi documentation. Yes, we have proof that the developer arguably deployed this, unless uh, the um, documentation has been tampered with, which can, can happen. But again, we have some proof that it was deployed by the de developer. We have a confirmation that is a contract, and we have some sort of external confirmation that is the right contract because it's called SushiSwap Router by multiple sources, by the source code. So I guess that's where you will go in the contract tab, the one below, and you'll see the name of the contract, right? That's, I guess, the last piece of verification you can do without any technical understanding. Does it, is it called the same name in here as the name in the documentation? And in this case, it is. It's called, it's actually called Uniswap V2 Router Uniswap. 02. Yeah. So let's go on the docs and see what they called it. Well, they, they called, called it, it the router, Sushi V2 right? Router 02. So this would actually, if you had enough suspicions, this is where you will go on, let's say, Lobster DAO on Telegram. You will go on Twitter. You will go on the, on the Sushi Discord and you will actually ask them, I verified the contract. The address is there, but the contract is called Uniswap V2 while you call it Sushi V2. Is that the right contract? Why is it called in a different way? Why does it have a different name? And then they would explain to you that they forked the code as in they literally used the same code as Uniswap and they just deployed it. And that's why it literally has the same name. Uh, the address in the gray area, the one uh, just above the edit permission button, that one is always the address that you're giving your approval to. Got it. So they would have gone through this and they would have seen... It would have said nothing. It would have said it, uh, yeah, would address, have said uh, maybe some transaction, maybe nothing. If you remember the shape we went through, it wouldn't have said contract because it wasn't a contract. It wouldn't have had the contract tab nor the verification, the green check mark. And it also would not show you the deployed by at, which is the sign of a contract because a contract is always deployed by somebody at some time. And so... Uh, that's how you can determine if it's a, a contract or a individual or a EOA. Got it. And that's kind of the first part of the uh, discussion. I think even for Sushi, if you are uh, on a, at a safe level enough, I personally, like uh, if we're talking about millions of dollars, I would want you to go on uh, Discord and ask uh, the Sushi devs why the contract is named in a different way. Because um, while we have a lot of reason to believe this is safe, if you do, can't read the code, because let's say you literally cannot read the code uh, and uh, we're not expecting you to, uh, then the fact that the contract has a different name from the one in the documentation should be a reason enough to at least warrant a uh, second uh, perspective. Because as, as we said multiple times, giving your approval literally means that whatever is in that gray area can move your tokens. They can move your coins to whatever they see fit or to whatever they are programmed for. And that's where it's really important that you understand uh, what the smart contract is gonna do once you do give them the approval. Um, I love that you went to the full transaction details. That's the second part of this discussion. The first part is the target. Basically, who are you giving approval to? Let's show it again how you open that detail because that's the core of uh, the second area of risk when you're dealing with approvals. Right? You have an option called view full transaction details, and that will show you some 
esoteric hexadecimal code. It's hexadecimal because it starts with 0x. Every time you see 0x, you want to think hexadecimal. And hexadecimal just means that it goes from 0 to f instead of from 0 to 9. Because f is 15 and hexadecimal is uh, denominated in uh, multiples of 16. So that's really all that's going on there. It looks a little funky, but at the end of the day, it's just hexadecimal. It's just numbers uh, denominated up to 16 instead of uh, 10. Okay? Got it. So this is the really scary thing that just happened, is that MetaMask, let's say we wanted to swap one ENS, right? Let's go on the UI. We wanted to swap one ENS, right? Mm -hmm. But what is MetaMask asking us to do? MetaMask is asking us to approve all of the ENS in existence. Look at the granted to, that's the contract, and then the approved amount. Yep. The approved amount is 115 blah, 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 E.59. It's a big number with 59 zeros. Okay, it's an insanely big number. And it's basically more than, I think it's literally more than the particles in the universe. It's uh, um, <laughs> two to the power of 32. And uh, it's being granted to the address that you can see. So this would be your second way to verify the contract. You see that you have the copy function right there on the right of contract. You would expect to get the same address and you will. It's literally 0x9e1ce. Um, and if you scroll up on the gray area, you'll see that it's the same one. Right, so you have a second yep. uh, option to re-verify the contract. And then you have the approved amount. And then lastly, at the bottom, you have the data. And this is where, if you're really serious about security, and that's why we wanna also show you a non-approval transaction. But if you're really serious about security, you really wanna check the data because everything else can be wrong, but the data doesn't lie. You can't lie at the data level because that's what you're gonna sign. That's literally the information that MetaMask is gonna take. You're gonna use your private key when you press the blue button, confirm, you're gonna use your private key to sign that data so that that can be executed. And so you, you wanna be at least familiar with this data and you wanna uh, try to understand it a little bit. Okay? And so uh, All right. if, you, if we have permission, I'd like to just show you how to interpret that stuff. Let's do it. Right? So the first thing, and this is like, again, no code, no experience. You see a bunch of F. F, 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 F. It's not, uh, you know, surrendering League of Legends. It's the <laughs> maximum number in the universe. So your brain, the second you see those, the second you see a bunch of zeros, you want to think no value. But the second you see a bunch of F, you want to think max value. Okay, yep. so all those Fs that you see, you see that there's a nine and, there's, and then there's like a, a bunch of Fs. Yep. yep. That means the amount that you're approving. Okay, that's the amount you're approving. It's basically the particles in the universe. The other thing you see is the D9, E1, CE1, F, etc. That's the address that you're approving for. If you check the contract, you'll see 0x9e1ce. That's literally oh, the after same. After all these zeros. That's the same. That's the address you're granting permission to move. And then the first thing you see on the top left is 0x, again means hexadecimal, and then 095ea7b3. This is what is called the function selector. This is a fancy way of saying they took the name approve, which you see above, and they convert it to hexadecimal. I've yet to find a tool that makes it easy for people to verify that, but the second I'll find it, I'll make sure to share it with the community. But basically, all they're doing is taking the approve um, name, and then they're adding a function called uh, kekak 256 which is a hashing function, and you get back those values. So for the rest of you, and again, as a, pro, as a known programmer, it doesn't matter, but for the rest of your interaction on Ethereum, approve in data in hexadecimal is always gonna have those values, those numbers, 095EA7B3. You could literally just for take any a contract, screenshot. That's the translation of the word appro of the exactly. approve function. That's, that literally means approve. 
That's all it means. And that means that, uh, and then you have a bunch of zeros because of how Ethereum works. They just need to make sure that uh, um, each value is 32 bits. And so to make uh, this very small value 32 bits, you just put a bunch of zeros. And then you're gonna have the address and then you're gonna have the amount. And so if you wanna get nerdy and you go and check Open Zeppelin for their official implementation, or I guess the, the universally recognized implementation of ERC20, which there's also an ERP here, but I'm, I'm, I'm losing the point. You'll see that a function approve starts with the target, the address that you're approving, which is a, a D9E1CE, and then the amount that you're approving for, which in this case is FFFFFF, et cetera, et cetera. Everything. Okay. So yep. now you can see a mapping between those. Again, a lot, a lot of Fs means max. A lot of um, uh, the, the 09C means approve, and then you have the target. So now we just want to swap one ENS. And this is, this is um, uh, what, what they call approval hygiene. So I know Ethereum is really expensive and you're basically going to punch yourself for doing it. But if you're really serious about not uh, putting yourself at excess risk, you will never approve more than what you need. So in this case, we want to sell one ENS. Why are we approving all the tokens in the universe if we only want to sell one? You can change that by going in the edit button of the permission request. So you see that there's permission request and there's edit, and you will be able to change to a custom spend limit, change it to one. Yeah, just one. It's going to figure out the decimals for you. And now if yep. you look at the data, the data has changed slightly. You still have the same selector, 095EA, approve. You still have the same address, D9E1CE, is same, the same target, mm -hmm. but now there's no more the Fs. You just have a very small number, which is DE0B6, blah, blah, blah. The reason why so it's not the one, of one. Yeah, you, you would be like, why it's not one? Well, that's because you have uh, token decimals in order to represent uh, decimals in Ethereum. We don't have uh, what is called floating points. We simply just put a bunch of zeros at the beginning. And so one ENS is actually one uh, times 10 to the 18 tokens because it has 18 decimals. And so mm -hmm. if you translate one times 10 to the 18 in hexadecimals, that's the number you're gonna get. And uh, if you want, you can go to hex to decimal on Google, and that may be a good idea. You can just copy that DE0 thingy, just go X to decimal and just paste it and see what the number looks like. It should look like uh, one to the 10 to the 18. And uh, I guess the biggest thing is we'll be talking for maybe 30 minutes plus, uh, but that's oh, because went, there's a it lot. It went back to FFF. Right? Ah, we even That's got the dark pattern of going back to FFF. So again, you need to, to be FFF, really, yeah. you need to be really careful with it because MetaMask is trying to make your life convenient uh, because people don't want to do this, you know, every time. But right. people regret not doing this every time it goes wrong. So let's see what we get. We get that number right there. So now to, to fully understand this, uh, Google if to weigh. Uh, where uh, no no go on Google and type if uh, eth to weigh yeah to weigh yeah uh, and then go on the um, ifconverter.com the second or third result yeah and then you can paste the weigh which will be the the number you got which was, was like um, one, one million something uh, just something. type eighteen times zero to be honest uh, type one and then eighteen times zero one two three etc. And you'll see that it's basically one ether. It's one ether of ENS because ether can be used as a unit where you, the unit is just 18, de 18 uh, zeros. That's what it is. But now you, you should have a very clear mapping between what MetaMask is trying to have you sign, which is this hexadecimal stuff and what you actually are doing, okay? So again, that information is there. You just have to really like slow down a little bit and try to fully understand it. We have this dark pattern 
of going back to the previous approval amount, which is the maximum, which is not something I would uh, uh, condone. Uh, but that's let's crazy. Say... Yeah, I clicked, I changed it and clicked save, and it's. I just clicked away, and it's back to the old one. So to to MetaMask defense, the browser uh, is a very sandboxed environment, and so every time you close MetaMask to go to a different tab. MetaMask has to basically reset and they have to do they have to change a lot of stuff. And so I understand the technical challenges. I think it's it maybe even impossible to remember what you put because every time you uh, refresh it has to take it back from uh, a database or something uh, which is in your machine for your own privacy. So there's a million of reasons why it's difficult. But what the takeaway here is that when you're doing the, um, the MetaMask operation, you have to be fully focused on it and you have to make sure that things don't change because as you saw, 10 seconds of destruction means that the approval or goes back to the maximum amount, right? You have to be really yep. careful about what you're doing because you can change that data and whatever data you see there is the data you're going to sign. But again, you have to be extremely careful that that data makes sense. So going back, remember the approved name the second one is the address. The third one is the amount. And every time you see a bunch of Fs, that means max. You, you don't need to know what the number is. It just means a lot. It's a lot of numbers. It's a big number. Okay. So would you recommend for every transaction you're doing to always put it for the exact number of tokens that you're intending to, to swap? Or is it just like if you're That's a using great, this token, um, if, if it's a huge part of your bag, then be more careful about this? Or is this something that you're doing every single time? Okay, so the, the official answer is that you always set the approval for the amount that you need to use. That's the official answer. Then the more realistic answer, let's say a good example would be going from Uniswap to SushiSwap to CowSwap to other swaps, let's say one inch, is that the first time you use them, you always set to the proper allowance. And then over time, as you see that they don't get hacked, your trust increases, then you may want to consider increasing the approval. However, for certain tokens, I'm thinking of if, WEF, USDC, the, the, the stuff that you have, uh, um, that you, you may have a lot at, at certain times and that you may not have a lot at other times, a die, meme, badger, you don't want to ever give them full approval because those tokens may be, you know, your savings, they may be your biggest bag, your investment. And so for stuff that has to be fast, let's say every time I have WEF, I just sell it on OpenSea. Perhaps I'll give full approval to the OpenSea router so I can do quick uh, NFT buys uh, over time. But that's because I know that in my wallet, I'll never have WEF unless I'm doing that. And so it's not that basic as saying, okay, I'm just going to give my approval. It's just a trade-off between security and convenience where I know uh, that for certain uh, types of code, for example, I'm not sure if you use DYDX, DYDX proved to have a, a multi-million dollar vulnerability just last week. Something happened with Gelato basically a few days ago as well. And so giving approval to a smart contract will basically always backfire. So you're really taking a trade-off to save those, uh, uh, you know, $50 in gas and then 15 seconds or one minute in waiting time, you are uh, taking that trade-off with the risk of literally losing everything. So from my experience, I have never regretted having to set it manually every time, never. I just got annoyed and, you know, you forget about being annoyed after 10 minutes, it doesn't matter. But I, I definitely regretted having my approval set to max because that's when, you know, when, when every time you see a hack on Twitter, you're going to shit your pants and you're going to run every single time. Well, if you set your approvals to the, to the amount, you, you can sleep comfy at night because nobody can take your coins. Let me, let me ask you this. So the way that we've been going through this, it's all on a per token basis, right? But I, I've heard that there are these, and I've gotten some in a different wallet, these like fake, uh, uh, you know, phishing tokens that they send you. And then once you try to interact with those tokens, then it drains your whole wallet. Is that true? Like, are there are there actions that you can take that put your entire uh, uh, private key at risk rather than just one token? 
there are actions that will put your private key at risk. And most likely it's signing, making signatures. Or that put... Sorry? So okay. if you sign, then you can sign. Like signing is a much more dangerous transaction than token approvals. No, signing is uh, what you always do whenever you sign any transaction. Uh, it's it's very nuanced. I will address, the, address your uh, question about the specific tokens. Uh, and from my understanding, the phishing tokens are trying to steal other tokens that are vulnerable or they're going to try to use other contracts that are vul vulnerable. And so um, are you familiar with Rune? Mm, Rune, uh, the... The Tor chain Rune? The Thor chain, Thor chain, yeah, yeah. So my understanding is that a few months ago, um, there was an exploit. And the exploit had to do with the implementation of uh, the transfer function for the Rune token. And if I'm not mistaken, the Rune token will not check for what is called the message.sender, which is the direct contract or account that is interacting with the token, but it will check for what is called the tx.origin, which is the first contract, or sorry, the first address that started the transaction. And so if you have some Rune, and Rune still has this vulnerability, or there are other tokens that have this type of vulnerability, then the second you interact with a malicious token, that token will have your TX.origin because you started the transaction and they're going to be able to steal all of those other vulnerable tokens or interact with those other vulnerable contracts. So from what I can tell, and I am 95% certain, so I'm not, uh, I'm pretty confident in this, you can lose tokens from a um, exploiting a phishing uh, token but the tokens you're going to lose are tokens that also have a uh, additional vulnerability as well. And that goes also for, to, uh, for contracts that have additional vulnerabilities. So if you gave allowance to a contract, let's say you gave allowance to the one inch router, which from my understanding is one of the safest contracts out there that is very used. But if you, if you think about it, if you gave allowance to the one inch router and the one inch router happens to have a vulnerability, they can steal all of the tokens that you approve the one inch router for, right? Because mm. the one inch router yeah. does what, what, uh, whatever uh, it's coded to do. And if it's coded to steal your funds because there is a vulnerability that nobody found out in over a year, uh, you're gonna be screwed. And so uh, that's kind of the risk you take in giving approval to either a uh, smart contract or obviously to an address because it literally is the equivalent of trusting them with um, giving approval is the equivalent of trusting them with your bank account when they tell you that they're not going to steal stuff. You just trust them on their word. And uh, similarly, signing a transaction without knowing what's going on is trusting the front end, the website, with literally with your life uh, for one time. Like literally, it's literally playing the Russian roulette where they have the gun though. You gave them the gun because if you press without looking, uh, they can load the gun however they want and you don't get to choose uh, because you're just pressing the button. And so that will be for the approvals. I think we covered everything uh, that there is, but I'd love to hear if you have some questions that you think may uh, come up when it comes to approvals. No, um, I have to run in about 10 minutes, but should we go through the rest of this uh, swap transaction? So we have this video can be like chapter one, and then it seems like we have more stuff to talk about. So maybe we can do like a, a, another, would love to do another episode um, with you on this. So let's, uh, let's finish paper handsing our one ENS and um, we can wrap it there. And then the next part we can go over the, some other contracts and, and other yep. things too. Actually, uh, to I would uh, recommend we just uh, um, approve for one ENS. And then we can have the second part where we talk about what we do when the swap has to happen and what happens there, how to understand what happens to your approval, verifying that it has changed and everything. Uh, so I would recommend you set the um, allowance to one token, just one, and then you just approve that and we see what happens there. Okay. And if you don't mind, I'd like for you, before you confirm, to do a screenshot of that data. I'll do a screenshot myself, but if you can do a screenshot with command shift free, just the data. Yeah, because that data will come in handy later. So let's go ahead and confirm. 
Again, we're giving one uh, approval of one ENS to the uh, SushiSwap router. We're seeing the transaction. Let's go on the MetaMask and fetch the uh, transaction. And uh, typically we'll wait, uh, you know, a minute, typically. Yeah, so now we get the activity tab on MetaMask. Let's see MetaMask. Oh. I have to go through and do this again. Ah, okay. Yep, we'll again set to one. And as you can see, it gets very tiring because you always have to do this, right? It's so much easier to just click the bot. But you, you basically want to get it the habit that these are very serious operations with pretty serious consequences. And so you want to make sure that you set them to uh, something that uh, is more uh, logical. In this case, only approving the token you want to sell instead of uh, uh, more. So I'm looking at my hardware wallet approval. Is there any additional checks that you recommend doing before clicking the hardware wallet approval? Yeah. Okay. So if you're using a hardware wallet, you will be presented with the data that you just screenshot. So it, it is only rational that you verify there's going to be a, a keyword, most likely target. The target in this case should be the ENS token because that's the, the contract we're interacting with is the contract of the token so that the token through the token contract, we can give approval to the SushiSwap router, which is the address that we verified multiple times for that specific amount. And so the first thing you'll see will be the target. And so you would probably want to um, copy that and verify on Etherscan that it's the ENS token. Basically, you're approving the token that you expect to approve. And then the second page should be the data, the data uh, visualization. And so if you see the data, you basically just compare it with the one you just screenshotted. Does it look exactly the same? Right. So I have blind signing turned on on mine, which probably you're going to tell me is a bad idea. But I don't it's know giving what me that is, uh, but yeah. Does it mean you don't verify the data? It's giving me an address, an OXC1 address. So I think that must be the um, Let's go on ENS Etherscan token, or that's what and I'm... type ENS and verify that it is OXC18360. That's ENS and it ends with D72. So that's how you typically verify an address on the fly. You just look at the first few numbers and the last few numbers. Uh, it's highly yep. unlikely you can uh, fake something like that, although it is possible. But again, definitely better than nothing. And so now you, you see the target, right? You verify mm -hmm. that that's the target address. And then the step after should be to verify that the data um, is the one you uh, screenshotted, is literally the same. Got it. Okay. That, yeah, that's not displaying on my wallet, but um, this contract is the same. Yeah. So, so if it's not displaying on your wallet, you definitely want to make sure that it does because while MetaMask is telling you that this is an approval function, if we change the selector of approve to a selector for transfer, you're actually giving your tokens away by pressing the button. The only thing that has to change is those five letters at the top uh, of the data to change the approve to a transfer. And you're literally, instead of giving the ability to move your funds, you're, you're literally moving your funds instantly. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, I think what was happening was I have this feature called blind signing. So I'm turning that off. Yeah. And uh, from Googling some resources, uh, it is highly recommended to always disable blind uh, signing after you use it with a trusted contract once. So it's a, a convenience utility to use once. It's definitely not a utility to set um, as the default. Got it. All right. So we set uh, to one. And every time you see like some weird stuff and it resets, you want to make sure that you didn't already sign it uh, as well. Because I know it uh, did some, you know, sometimes it just, breaks or whatever. Let's go MetaMask. Let's see the transaction. We're not seeing any confirmation on the um, on here. So we're not seeing it there yeah, as well. Yeah, my wallet's being weird. It's not giving me the approval on the wallet. All right. Well, that's fine. So I guess we'll uh, pause there for the sake of time. Uh, but yeah, the conclusion is to check the contract, check the target, check the data, and make sure to give only the approval for what is necessary. Um, 
over time you may it may, it may be acceptable to reduce your guard a little bit but you always want to remember that the downside of reducing your guard is a lot higher than uh, just losing uh, an extra minute to do something that you you're not gonna do a million times i would be surprised if most people run a significant swap uh, uh, more than a few times a day so what is the point of uh, saving one minute when you can literally lose everything if you don't um, that's kind of yeah. um, the message at this point you know you in using metamask you basically opted in in self-custody you opted in with the fact that you are responsible for your keys because it's your keys and your coins and so you want to be extremely mindful of uh, what can happen my kind of closing statement is that with time because web3 is going to become big and popular attackers are going to just hack websites and then attack you on your metamask so if you don't understand how metamask works and how your wallet is functioning you're going to be attacked a lot and so you need to really develop this skill as soon as possible because attackers are realizing that if they steal your twitter they can just you know sell some follows on, on fiverr or something make up 100 bucks but if they convince you to sign your metamask away they're going to take all of your money and so it is extremely uh, important that you fully understand what you're doing and hope, i hope uh, this uh, uh, session on uh, approvals was sufficient to give you at least some understanding of what you can do to protect yourself and to be safe out there yeah no this is really eye-opening for me i mean i think i had probably no known about like the first step of this and thought i was good but it it's super helpful to run through this like from first principles and i will definitely be using these uh going forward um so so thanks so much i think we'll look forward to a second video where we go through the second part of this and um maybe we can look at revoking approvals too and what you should do i mean like i have this one wallet that I, was basically like my dgen wallet from the beginning of DeFi summer so i'm like ashamed to uh to have uh have someone look through it and see all of the sketchy crap that I've probably approved on that. So I think uh, I think probably a lot of us who are listening have uh, have some hygiene issues that that need to be resolved. So let's uh, let's put a uh, part two on the calendar and get that out there too. Sounds great. Thank you for your time, man. Awesome. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.